So a quick review of just uh, lenses in general. If you've got a converging lens, we put an optical axis here, and let's say we know where the focal point is, or focal points, because a lens has two. And let's say we put an object So from that object, we've got rays of light going in all directions. Uh, what are the three rays of light that are going to be easiest to actually trace out here if we wanted to use ray tracing? What rays of light could we start with? Sorry, what was that? Through the focal point? Yeah, we could have one ray of light from the object through the focal point. A ray of light through that near focal point is going to hit the lens and change to what direction? It's going to bend to become what? Horizontal? Yeah. And generally, I wouldn't necessarily say horizontal, I would say parallel, because the, the optical axis itself doesn't have to be parallel. You might have a situation where maybe the lens itself is horizontal and the optical axis is parallel. So in that case, any ray of light going through the focal point is going to become still parallel to the axis. It's just that that doesn't have to be horizontal. So I would specifically describe that as becoming parallel to the axis. So that's one way we can always draw in uh, for a converging lens. And what else would also work? We could start off parallel to the optical axis. Yeah, any ray of light that starts parallel is going to bend in what way? It will go through the far focal point. Yeah, if it starts parallel on one side, it bends towards the focal point on the other side. And note that we already can see where those rays of light will cross. So that's going to be where we should find the image. To be sure, we can also draw in one more line. What ray of light will always work for any type of lens? Um, does one go straight through the middle? Yeah. Any ray of light that's going towards the exact center of the lens is just going to continue in a straight line. And note that we've got rays of light going in all directions here. It's just that these three, the principal rays, are just happen to be the ones that are easiest to draw because these, they follow these very consistent predictable patterns. Which means if you're standing over here as an observer, from your perspective, it seems like all the light is coming from this point. Ignoring everything up to this point, as far as you can tell, this point may as well be the object. It's where the light is coming from. So we would call that the image. And since that's below the axis instead of above, this is going to be an upside down image. And would we call that real or virtual? Real? Yeah. This would be a real image because the rays of light really pass through that point. <clears throat> and then we could calculate the, uh, the distances involved. If we knew, for instance, the focal length and the object distance, we could use the thin lens equation to find the image distance. Things are going to be different if we place the object inside the focal point. We can still draw basically the same rays, but they're going to look a little different. So let's say we've got the exact same lens, same focal length, But if we put the object inside the focal length here, some of the rays are still going to be drawn exactly the same. We can still draw a ray straight through the center that keeps going. We can still draw a ray that starts parallel and bends towards the far focal point. We can't really draw a ray from the object towards the near focal point, though. So instead, what do we do?
instead of going from the object towards the, far, the near focal point, what would we have to do instead? You would draw a ray going away from the near focal point? Yeah, in a straight line and directly away from the near focal point, because that's at least on the same line. It doesn't really matter whether it's going towards or away. The important thing is it's a ray of light that's on the same line as the focal point. So any ray of light passing along the same line as the focal point is going to bend to become parallel. These rays of light never intersect over here. So what does that mean? It's virtual. Right. We're going to get a virtual image on the back side. So we have to backtrace all these rays of light. We're imagining where could they have come from? If we just take all these straight lines and continue them backwards, they all seem to come from here. So that would be the virtual image. A little bit further in the object, right side up, and a little bit bigger as well. And again, this image is just the point that these final rays of light seem to be coming from. Also, since the image is not on the side of, of the lens that the rays of light are traveling on at the end, we're going to call this a negative image, a negative distance. The side lights traveling on at the end is what we call positive. Since the image is behind that, we call this a negative image. <clears throat> or at least we call the we call the image virtual, we call the distance a negative value. Any questions on that so far? And note that these are essentially the same three principal rays, because it's in both cases, it's the same converging lens. It's just that you've got to be careful about whether you're drawing a ray towards the near focal point or away from the near focal point. But it's the same idea. It's just a ray of light on the same line as the near focal point. Any questions on these examples so far? So converging lens can produce real image or virtual image, depending on whether the object is outside the focal length or inside the focal length. If we look at a diverging lens instead, though, we're going to have some rather different, uh, different options. For a diverging lens, usually drawn like this, <clears throat> which we signify numerically by writing the focal length as a negative number. And let's say we've got a focal length, maybe this far on both sides. That should be close enough. And let's say we have an object. Let's say the object is here. For the diverging lens, we're going to have a similar start. For one thing, a ray of light from the object through the center is just going to keep going in a straight line. That's still valid, the central ray. But what's different is a ray that starts off parallel, instead of bending towards the far focal point, what would it do instead? It's going to bend away from the near focal point. Yeah, instead of bending towards the near focal point or far focal point, it's going to bend away from the near focal point. It's still collinear with a focal point. It's just collinear with the other focal point. So that would look like along a line. If you make a line, basically you put your straight edge between the intersection point and the near focal point. Continue that line outwards. So this dotted line is just framework. That's not actually the path taken by the light. The light is traveling parallel and then bends so that it's not going away from <clears throat> away from the near focal point. In a sense, you could say that the diverging lens is essentially a converging lens that is turned inside out. It's had its focal points swapped. So for converging, parallel becomes collinear with this focal point. For diverging, parallel becomes collinear with the other focal point collinear in the sense of on the same line as. 
And then same idea for the other ray, for the converging lens, we had a ray of light along the same line as the near focal point. Here we're gonna have a ray of light along the same line as the far focal point. So going towards the far focal point, toward, from the object towards the far focal point, never actually gets there because the lens is in the way. But that's gonna to bend to become what? Um, parallel. Yeah, that one bends to become parallel to the central axis or optical axis. So it is very similar to this ray on the current converging lens. Converging, if you have a ray of light that's collinear with the near focal point, it bends to become parallel. For diverging, a ray collinear with the far focal point bends to become parallel. So it really is the same idea, just re uh, reversed or turned inside out in a sense. That's our three final parallel, our three final rays. They're never going to intersect over here. So what do we do instead? Backtrace. Yeah, backtrace each one of these. The central rays is sort of already backtraced, so we don't need to worry about that too much. And there's the point where they all seem to be coming from. So that is the location of our shrunken virtual image. <clears throat> and it turns out that for a diverging lens, you always get a virtual image. No matter where you put the object, whether it's beyond the focal point or inside the focal length or even on the focal point itself, the diverging lens will always produce a virtual image from an actual physical object. Any questions on that so far? And as usual, the direction light is traveling at the end is the positive direction. So if the image is on the other side, we call it a negative value for I. Casey, I have a quick question. Mm -hmm. So for the lenses, you, um, like I've seen examples where focal point can be like positive or negative, like say 10 centimeters. Mm -hmm. And since there's two focal points, like from the lens to each focal point, would it be like negative 10 or 10 like for both or would it one be like positive and one be negative? Does that make sense? Yeah, the focal point, it does have two focal points but they're equidistant on both sides. So we really just need one number to represent both focal points. Uh, and what okay. you mentioned is we use a positive value for F to represent a converging lens and we use a negative value for F to represent a diverging lens. And okay. The reason for that is so that it works out in the thin lens equation. I'm using uh, okay. convention we can just use one equation that works equally well for both types of lenses and also both types of mirrors. We don't need separate equations for the different types of lenses and mirrors. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions on that so far? So let's try applying all this to corrective lenses and see what we can do to fix nearsightedness and farsightedness. <clears throat> uh, let's start with nearsightedness. Meaning the patient can see stuff that's close just fine but far away objects look blurry. And why would that be? Why would it be difficult to see a far away object and see it clearly? Why would it look blurry in the first place? If you've got the eye, and you've got uh, light coming in from an object. Let's say, let me put an optical axis here. Let's say we've got an object over here. Light's coming from the object towards the eye. And in principle, if everything's working perfectly, what should happen to this light when it hits the eye? Uh, 
hit the retina? Oh, yeah, you want the light to get to the retina, which is at the back of the eye. Retina is basically acting as a projector screen. We want light to hit the retina and form an image at exactly that location. So the retina, the, the light sensitive cells in the retina can turn the light into a nerve impulse along nerves and get to the brain. <clears throat> so how do we take all this light coming out and make it hit the retina? What needs to be happening when the light hits the eye? What do you have at the front side of the eye? What's the first part of the eye that the light hits? The lens? Yeah, at the front of the eye, there's a lens. Not made of glass, of course, but just a, a flattened blob of material that allows light to get through, but bends it. And since it's convex in shape, it's gonna act like a converging lens. So light is gonna hit this lens in the front of the eye. This light coming out of the object, some of it hits the lens of the eye. And we want this light to bend so it forms an image. And what kind of image do we wanna form here? A real image? Yeah, if you want the image to actually show up on a projector screen, which the retina acts like, you need to have a real image. A virtual image means the light is not actually going through that point. We don't want an image to not actually show up because the light's not really passing through that point. We want a virtual image on the retina, which does mean it's gonna be upside down <clears throat> compared to the original object, but the brain adapts for that because that's what it's accustomed to. And of course you want the image to appear exactly on the retina. If the image does not form on the retina, if it's a little bit too close or a little bit too far, that's when you get something looking blurry. Things look blurry when the image does not appear exactly on the retina, when it's a little too close or a little too far. Because if the image is too far back, these rays of light don't quite intersect. They're gonna hit a more, sp a more spread out region on the retina rather than one specific point. And so you don't really resolve it to a nice, clear, crisp, visible image. So you want to make sure the image appears exactly on the retina. Going back to the thin lens equation, that means image distance has to be distance from lens to retina. That does not change. You can't telescope your eyes. You can't like shift the lens forward and backwards. So this distance is fixed. Image distance is a constant. I think it's about two and a half centimeters for a typical eye. So the image distance has to be two and a half centimeters if we're talking about the image formed inside the eye. But the object distance is not constant. We wanna be able to look at objects that are various distances away. So if I has to be the distance from lens to retina and that doesn't change, but O can change. How do you adapt your eye to make this image still work? Change the focal length. Yeah, you've got to change the focal length. And this is one of the situations where the lens in the eye behaves very differently from a glass or plastic lens in, for instance, a digital projector. With a projector, the lens is usually made out of molded plastic or ground glass, and you can't change its shape. Once you've made the lens, its focal distance remains constant. You can move it forward and backwards, so you can change I and O in the digital projector by just moving it back and forth, but you can't change F. For the lens in the eye, it's the opposite. You can't change uh, the image distance. It has to appear on the retina, the image does but you can change the focal length by squeezing and relaxing the muscles in the eye. Because this lens is flexible. It's made out of this squishy, transparent material. If the muscles in your eye squeeze, it makes the lens bulge out a little bit. If they relax, it makes it flex back a little bit. So you can change the shape and therefore the focal length of the lens in the eye by using the muscles in your eye. And this is what it means to focus on nearer or far objects. If you hold your fingers up really close and then move them further away, 
if everything's working as it should, the muscles in your eye automatically adapt to make things look clear. And you can actually see this if you hold something really close and focus on it, everything in the background looks a little blurry. And then if you refocus and stare off at the background, the stuff right in front of you looks blurry because you're adapting your lens in your eye to focus on something far away or something close. And stuff that's not at that distance looks blurry. Any questions on how that works so far? Now, most of the things that can go wrong with this system are if the lens becomes less flexible or if the muscles around it get weaker. If it becomes difficult to squeeze and relax that muscles around the lens, you can't adapt the value of the focal distance as much as you would like. And so maybe there are some objects that are so close that the lens can't adapt and the image doesn't show up on the retina like it should. Or maybe an object so far away that the lens can't adapt enough and can't put the image on the retina. So this is the origin of nearsightedness and farsightedness. When the muscles around the, uh, around the lens are unable to adapt the lens enough to be suitable for very close objects or very far objects. One way to deal with that is to do eye surgery and change the lens or the muscles around it so that it can adapt again. But short of that, without messing around with the inside of the eye, you can still correct this using the corrective lenses, the eyeglasses or spectacles. And typically the way that works is you take an object that the eye can't see clearly and turn it into an image that the eye can see clearly. We wanna take an object that doesn't work very well and create an image that, the, that does work, an image that the eye can see. For example, for a nearsighted patient, nearsighted person can see near objects just fine. So that's not a problem. But stuff that's far away, like let's say you wanna look at a mountain or a building in the distance or the moon or stars, those are very far away and you can't focus on them. So in order to fix that, let's take a look at that worst case scenario. Let's say, suppose the patient <clears throat> can only see clearly up to, let's say 20 meters away and everything beyond that looks blurry. We call the 20 meters the far point. So the far point, the patient's far point is the furthest thing away that patient can see. So everything up to 20 meters looks fine, anything beyond 20 meters away or whatever the distance is looks blurry. But ideally, you don't wanna just spend your whole life only looking at things 20 meters away. Ideally, you'd like to be able to see things how far away. Infinitely. What was that? I think in class we said infinitely far. Yeah, ideally you wanna be able to see very, very far away, which we would treat as essentially infinite. And of course the distance to, for instance, the moon isn't really infinite, but it's so long we can treat it as almost infinite. So that's the ideal, the ideal result. We wanna be able to see something very far away. So we're gonna treat that as the object. Let's say you wanna look at the moon. Light is coming from the moon. So we're gonna treat the moon as the object. And I tend to think of this as a worst case scenario. Treat the worst case scenario as the object. <clears throat> you would like to be able to see a very far away object. That is O equals infinity. You wanna be able to see the stars or the moon or a very far away mountain or building, but you can only see things up to 20 meters away. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna put a lens right in front of the eye and we want that lens to take the object that's very far away and turn it into an image that's only 20 meters away so that you can see that image. That's really the whole point of corrective lenses like this. We take an object you can't see and turn it into an image that you can see. So let's say, here's your eye.
and there's something very, very far away. A far away object. We want to create an image using a corrected lens. We put in a, a lens which is so close to the eye, we can treat it as essentially being at the location of the eye. We want this lens to turn the faraway object into an image that's closer so you can see it. And would we want that to be a real image or a virtual image? Do you want an image that's upside down and behind your head or right side up and seems to be in front of you? I think in lab they're saying virtual, but I'm kind of confused by that. It is a virtual image and that's really because of where we want it to show up. Uh, uh, and remember, remember, if we're looking at the direction light is traveling, <clears throat> light's traveling this way in this case, from the object towards the lens and the eye. And we treat the direction lights traveling as the positive direction. Because light's going to go towards the lens and keep going. So a real image that is a positive value for I would be on the positive side of the lens and upside down because it's going to go through the center. A virtual image would be on the opposite side of the lens, the side, same side as the object. That is not the direction light is traveling. So a virtual image would be over here. And you really want a virtual image because you want the image to seem like it's in front of you. You don't want to turn towards an object and get the idea that the object is behind you and upside down. You want the object to look like it's in front of you and right side up. You want an image that's at your far point. You want the really far away object to turn into an image that you can see. So we want that image to be at a distance equal to the far point, in this case, 20 meters. So we want to make a virtual image. So the lens, the corrected lens is going to turn the object into a virtual image. That light then hits the eye and the lens in the eye turns it into a real image on the retina. But we don't really need to worry about what's happening inside the eye at this point. We can just say we want the lens to create an image 20 meters away. And since it's a virtual image and on the opposite side from the direction light is traveling, should we call this positive 20 or negative 20? Negative 20? Yeah, it should be negative 20. Positive is defined as the direction light is traveling after it goes through the lens. So this is, it. since light is traveling this way, this direction is positive, but we want the image over here. We want the image to seem to be in front of you. So that's in the negative direction. So we're going to say image distance is negative 20 meters. Meanwhile, we're assuming the object is very far away. O is approximately infinity. And if we know object distance and the desired image distance, what can we solve for? Is it the optical power? Was that what it's called? Yes. But what is it, where, where does that show up in the thin lens equation? In the thin lens equation, if you know O and I, you can find F. Yeah, you can find F, the focal length. So if we put this into the thin lens equation, 1 over O plus 1 over I equals 1 over F, you could solve for F to find the focal length of the lens. But also, in uh, optometry, we usually just treat 1 over f as the value we're looking for. And 1 over f is called the optical power. So the optical power is just a measurement. It is just 1 over the focal length. So a long focal length means a small optical power. A short focal length means a large optical power. So let's try solving for that. If we actually plug in these values, we, we know object distance is infinity. Image distance, we want to be negative 20. Or more broadly, negative patient's far point. So whatever is the furthest thing the patient can see clearly and everything beyond that is blurry, negative that distance is the image distance we want to use. 
And what's one over infinity? Mm -hmm. That's zero. You take one divided by a larger and larger and larger number, the value gets closer and closer and closer to zero. So one over infinity, formally this should be written mathematically as a limit, but we can just say one over infinity is zero. So we just get negative 1 20th meter, or one over meter equals one over F. So there are a couple of ways we could describe this. We could say the optical power is negative 1 20th meter. So that'd be negative 0.05, I guess. So negative 0.05 diopters is usually how it's described. Diopters would just be, I think it's one over meters. It might be one over centimeters. You might want to check that. Uh, but diopters is just a measurement of the inverse of the focal length. Or if you solve for the focal length, what would you actually get for F here? How would you isolate F in this equation? Would you just get negative 20? Yeah, we just invert both sides. We get F equals negative 20 meters. So that means the lens here, in order to correct for this, this vision problem, to correct for nearsightedness with the far point being 20 meters away, you need lenses with focal length of 20 meters. In fact, in general, for nearsightedness, you just want a lens whose, far, whose focal length is your far point. Also, since this is a negative here, what type of lens is it? Diverging? Yeah, a negative value for F means this is a diverging lens. So to correct nearsightedness, you need a diverging lens, which would presumably be concave in shape. So in order to correct nearsightedness, you need a diverging lens whose focal length is negative whatever your near point is, or sorry, whatever your far point is. The furthest distance you can see clearly before it becomes blurry, negative that distance is the focal length you want. And so this is how a glasses prescription would be formed. You check how far away the patient can see before it becomes blurry, make a lens that has that focal length by grinding the glass to the correct shape. Or perhaps more commonly, you would just have um, a bunch of lenses with different focal lengths and you'd have the patient try them, try various ones on until you get one that works. But this is what determines what lens is going to work. Any other questions on the nearsightedness? Um, can you explain again why I is negative? Yeah, because we want a virtual image. Uh, a, real, a real image would be on the other side of the lens, which means it would form an image beyond the, the other side of your head. We don't want an image 20 meters behind you. We want an image 20 meters in front of you so you can actually look straight at it. Also, a real image would be upside down, and that's not going to be very useful. So the um, area in front of the lens is just negative for I? Yeah. And that's because we define positive as the direction light is traveling at the end. Light's going from the object towards the lens and then continues through the lens. So we treat this direction as positive. If the image is over here instead, that's the negative side of the lens. Positive side of the lens is the direction light is traveling at the end the side it came from is the negative side. OK, thanks. Any other questions on that? Um, Casey, I just had a real quick question. So because this is a diverging lens, is the image going to be smaller, like to the per? Uh, yes, the image is going to be smaller than the object, but it's also going to appear closer. So those are at least what we want to OK, OK, thank you. Mm -hmm. In fact, I think if the lens, if we treat the lens as being at the same location as your eye, I think those would completely cancel out. So the fact that it's smaller and closer, it still takes up the same percentage of your overall field of vision. The fact that the lenses are, are a little bit in front of your eye, they're not exactly on your eye, they're a little bit in front means that doesn't quite work, but it's gonna look pretty close. And this is ultimately why when you put on glasses, and this is, I think, most noticeable if you put on somebody else's glasses, there's this uh, uh, subtle shift. It looks like the whole world changes its position very slightly as you put the glasses on. That's because you're essentially taking the entire world out to infinity and condensing it into this smaller region, the region that you can actually see. 
because it's not just the far away object. Every object gets an image that's closer. So you're basically taking the entire world from zero out to infinity and condensing it into this smaller zone from zero to 20 meters or whatever the distance is. Any questions on that? And then farsightedness is a very similar concept, except it's the, in the opposite direction. For farsightedness, you can see far away stuff just fine, but things that are too close are blurry. And the thing is, everybody is to some extent farsighted. No matter how good your vision is, if you bring your fingers in like really close to your eye, they're gonna look blurry. So there's some distance that, that we say is good enough, usually about maybe 20 or 25 centimeters, like the distance it would be comfortable to hold a book or a screen or something. So for, for, for farsighted patients, the goal isn't to allow them to see stuff that's right up in front of their eyes. It's to make it possible to see objects that are a reasonable distance, maybe 25 centimeters or something. So again, we look at worst case scenario. You assume, like, let's say you can't see objects that are close. You can only see objects that are like three meters away. You wouldn't want to hold a book three meters away. You want to hold the book at about maybe 25 centimeters. So you'd imagine putting the object at 25 centimeters, the worst case scenario, so close you can't see it at all. And you want lenses that create an image that's further away so you can actually see it. So let's say your near point, the closest thing you can see clearly is three meters away. We want an object at let's say 25 centimeters to turn into an image three meters away. And again, it still needs to be a virtual image. So you'd still be using negative value for the image distance. But beyond that, it's the same idea. You plug in the worst case scenario for the object, in this case, something close, maybe 25 centimeters, 0.25 meters. Plug in where you want the image to appear as, as I, so that'd be negative three meters, the near point, and solve for F. That'll tell you what type of lens you need in order to make this work. Any other questions on that? Um, yeah, I have a question. So like, um, when we're given a problem where there's two different lenses and they say that they're a given distance away, um, do you use ray tracing to find, like I understand that the um, image of the first lens is the object for the second lens, um, but is ray tracing the only way to find that or how would we apply this to like a problem like that? Ray tracing is useful for getting a visual idea of what's going on, but it's usually not all that great for getting exact values. So using the thin lens equation is a much better tool for getting the actual numbers. So let's try using that. Let's say we have two converging lenses. Let's say one with focal length, let's say 10 centimeters, and another with focal length, Twenty centimeters. Let's call these F1 and F2, and let's say they are fifty centimeters apart. And we usually call that D for distance. And we're assuming they're sharing the same optical axis. They're both lined up parallel to each other. So this one has a focal length one tenth of that or one fifth of that distance. Something like that. And this one is twice as far. Something like that. So we've got 10 centimeter focal length and 20 centimeter focal length. And let's say we put an object on the left side here. Let's say an object at maybe 15 centimeters out. So object, or I'm gonna call this O1, is 15 centimeters. We could do ray tracing, but it's gonna be much more practical and a lot faster as well, I think, to use the thin lens equation. So one over F equals one over O plus one over I. But we're gonna to wanna to find the image from this, and then we're gonna to wanna to find the image the next lens creates. If we're gonna to have to find I over and over again, it's gonna be a lot more, a lot easier and a lot faster to solve for I once and for all. 
So if you isolate I in this equation before we even plug in any numbers, anyone remember what that works out to as a general formula for I? Um, I think it was F times O over O minus F. Yes, the product divided by the difference. You get that by subtracting one over O from both sides, then uh, finding a common denominator and inverting. And this is our formula for image. So we can use this universally. Anytime you know the object and the focal length and you're trying to find the image distance, we can just apply this as is. It's the same as the thin lens equation, just uh, refocused on a different variable. So if we plug these values in, we know that for the first lens only, first lens, we know the object distance is 15, the focal length is 10. So the image I1 is going to be object distance times focal length divided by object distance minus focal length. So that's 15 times 10 over 15 minus 10 is 5. Uh, 10 over 5 reduces to 2 times 15 would be 30. So that means that this lens is going to create an image at a location of 30. And since that's positive, that's going to be on which side of the lens? Or what type of image is this? A real image? Yeah, this is going to be a real image. And positive signifies on the side in the direction light is traveling. Light is traveling this way. So we're going to treat the side of the lens that light is traveling on as the positive direction. And so where would that be? If we go 30 centimeters, that's 30 centimeters beyond this lens. So where's that going to end up? The focal length two. Yeah, we're going to get a real image, which means upside down, at this focal point. And that's actually a problem because what happens if you put an image at the focal point, or put if you put the object at the focal point? There's no image. No image. So this system would actually not produce a final image. The first lens would produce an image here. But we want to treat that image as the object for the second lens, and an object at the focal length doesn't produce an image. So I'm going to make a change to this. Let's say instead of 20 centimeters, let's just pretend I said, uh, let's say, 25 centimeters. So this was never 20 centimeters. This was just 25 centimeters all along. And then we'll use that. And using the thin lens equation, should we never account for any negatives? I would always include the negatives, actually. Uh, if there are negatives, you definitely want to include the negatives in the thin lens equation. The thin lens equation is designed with the correct positive and negative terms in mind. So in general, the object, if you're using an actual physical object, O is going to be positive. For the image, the side light is traveling towards is going to be positive. The other side is negative. And for F, converging is positive and diverging is negative. So each one of these values has a convention for when to use positives and when to use negatives. For focal length, positive means converging, negative means diverging. For image distance, positive is the direction lights traveling at the end, and negative is the other direction. And that's true for both lenses and mirrors. As long as you use those conventions, it's true for lenses and mirrors. And this is, again, this is just to make it so we have one unified equation that works for any type of lens, any type of mirror. Uh, so let's say this, is, this would be the image from the first lens. Image from the first lens. But the image is really just the point that light seems to be coming from. The light doesn't just stop there, it keeps going. So as far as the second lens is concerned, the image from the first lens seems to be where the light was coming from. So we can treat the image from the first lens as the new object. Image from the first lens becomes the object for the next lens. 
And then this second lens is going to take this object and turn it into an image of its own. And if there was a third lens, then the image from the second lens becomes the object for the third lens and so on until we get to the end of the chain of lenses. This is also true for mirrors. If you got light going through a lens and bouncing off of a mirror, the image from that first lens becomes the object for that next mirror and so on. So you can mix and match. In this case though, we're gonna use, uh, we're gonna set up another equation for the second lens to find I2, which means we're gonna need an object distance and a focal distance. F is just gonna be 25. But we need to find the object distance. Can we just use 30 for that? Because the image becomes the new object. Can we just use 30 for O? Would it be 20? Yeah, why do we have to use 20 instead? Um, is it like with respect to the next lens? Right. It's the object distance as measured from the second lens, not as measured from the first lens. So if you set up the distances here, the image distance I1 is 30, but the object distance O2 is gonna be the other 20 centimeters. And if it's not obvious from the geometry, you can always calculate it because what do I1 and O2 have to add up to? Fifty. Yeah, that distance between the lenses. So you can use this in general to find O2. Once you've found the image distance from the first lens, you can just subtract that from D, the distance between the lenses. And find the second object distance. And notably, this even works if you've got a virtual image. If you had a virtual image way back here, I1 would be negative. So D minus I1 would be a larger number because your distance would be larger than D. So this works even if I1 is negative. In fact, it turns out this even works if I1 is larger than D. Let's say this created an image that was like 60 centimeters over here. 50 minus 60 would be what? If I1 was 60 centimeters, what's 50 minus 60? Negative 10. Right, you get a negative value for the object distance. This is, as far as I know, the one and only sort of circumstance that leads to O being negative. If the object for the second lens, so if the image appears beyond the location of the second lens, then O2 is a negative number. We would call that a virtual object, but the equation still works. You just plug in a negative number for O, and the thin lens equation still tells you the correct location for the final image. In this case though, we have a real object. It's a real image which becomes a real object because O is positive. O2 is in this case 50 minus 30, so that'd be 20. We plug all this in, O2 times F2 over O2 minus F2. 20 minus 25, so that's gonna be negative five. And we can reduce the 25 over five becomes just five over one. 20 times five would be 100, but it's negative 100. So that means the image is 100 centimeters away from lens number two, and what does the negative signify? What kind of image do we have if I is negative? A virtual image? Yeah. This is going to be a virtual image. Lens, so lens one turns the object into a real image. Lens two turns that real image into a virtual image 100 centimeters back. So the final image is going to be way back there. If you're looking through this like, a, as, like a, as if it were a telescope, what you're going to see is an image 100 centimeters away in that direction. And you can also use magnification here. If you use the magnification equation, you can use it separately on each lens to figure out 
an M value for the first lens and an M value for the second lens, and then just multiply those together to get the total magnification factor because magnification is a multiplier. So you wanna multiply M1 times M2. Any other questions on that? All right, so uh, try some more examples on this on your own, uh, either today or tomorrow or over the weekend. Uh, just make up a couple of lenses, make up a couple of focal distances, make up a distance between them and make up a location to put an object and try going through these same calculations. Use the thin lens equation to find the image from the first lens, then use this equation to figure out where the object is in relation to the second lens or just geometry. And then use the thin lens equation again to find the image created by the second lens. And then try drawing out the ray tracing and see if it matches up with the predictions from the equations. So give that a try. The more practice you get on this, the more intuitive it becomes. And have a good weekend and I'll see you next time. Um, I have a quick question actually. Yep. So if the image is positive, then does that always mean it's a real image that is behind the lens? Like those come in hand in hand? Yeah, yeah, positive value for I means that it's on the side light is traveling on. So that would be a real image. Negative image means it's on the side that light is not traveling on. So that would be a virtual image. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. See you later.